Hola, guapas, and welcome to episode 11 of the Hola Guapa podcast. For those of you who are new to the show, I'm your host, Nisha Batesh. I'm also the founder and creative at Hola Guapa, a digital community of almost 10,000 artists and creatives from all over the world, a blog, a website, an online shop, a podcast, and most recently, a small batch, slow fashion line. On this podcast, we take the creative conversations even further, sharing the real stories, tips, and tricks the artists in this community have found on their journeys to success. Okay, guapas, if you're feeling stuck or inspired with your career path, love life, or just life in general, then this episode is for you. Laura went from working as a product and graphic designer for Dior in Paris, France, to meeting the love of her life on the stoop of an Airbnb on a girl's trip to New York City, never ending up getting back on her return flight home to opening her very first and successful tattoo shop in Brooklyn, New York. While some of us can't currently travel due to COVID restrictions, we can all live vicariously through her story of being the ultimate yes girl. Once she decided to officially stay in New York City, she began working as a bartender and doodling on the side to express herself creatively. It wasn't long before her now husband and friends began asking to have her drawings tattooed on them and something magical clicked. But believe it or not, that's only where her story begins. Now a business owner, new mom, and 87,000 followers on Instagram later, Laura unpacks her journey to success, sharing the roadblocks she faced as a new tattoo artist, how she never took no for an answer, (laughs) literally, And most importantly, how being determined and bold enough to own your power as a female, own your medium, no matter how out of the box it might be, and own your unique artistic style is the perfect recipe for a fulfilling, fruitful, and passionate career as the creative you were born to be. So as we get into the episode, go check out her gram at Nothing Wild Tattoo to get a vibe for her drool-worthy and feminine aesthetic. And with that, let's get into the show. Hi, um, my name is Laura Martinez. I'm a tattoo artist. I've been tattooing for about um, five, six years now. And I used to live in Brooklyn, New York, but I just moved to France since I had a little baby last month. Actually, a month and a half ago. Wild. So you're back in Paris now. How long were you in New York? I, I was living in New York for eight years. Uh, this is where I discovered... Um, tattooing. I mean, I've always loved tattoos since I was uh, very young, but I started tattooing in New York, in Brooklyn. Um, And when I got pregnant about 10 months ago, me and my husband, he's American, we thought that it could be nice to be in a different country and uh, move back to where I'm from. Uh, We don't live in Paris, we live in Tours, which is in the Loire Valley. So it's like an hour train from Paris and it's beautiful. It's the wine region. Uh, so we're very happy to be here. It's, uh, it's a little more like of a city with the countryside next, nearby. So it's just less stressful than New York is with a baby. Oh my God. I know. I can only imagine. I kind of want to yeah. get into, um, you know, your experience in New York and sort of your journey to becoming a tattoo artist. Cause I know it wasn't a direct route to becoming a tattoo artist. You started as a graphic design artist and a product design artist, correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. can you tell us about that and sort of how you transitioned from sort of that career into tattooing full time? So it was a little crazy. Uh, I don't have a, a classic story, I think. Uh, I was a, a product designer. I was working in um, for Dior in Paris, but I wasn't very satisfied. Um, I wanted to work more like for things that I can do on my own, something that's more open and with a big brand like Dior everything is already like pretty much set up. So the creativity was uh, not that open. Um, and my friends were going to, to New York uh, for vacation. So I just went with them. And I have the use of just listening to my heart and following what I want to do in the moment. And when I got to New York, I met a guy, Sam, on the stoop of my Airbnb. And <laughs> I fell in love. And that's what made me decide to not go back to France like I had planned after my holidays. So I just stayed in the U.S. And 
a few months later we got married so i could stay with him and uh, get a green card but it takes a long time to actually get your green card once you get married uh, so in the meanwhile i worked in a bar and i've never done that in my life i have a product design background so that was very new but i was very happy i met a lot of people very good friends that i'm still friends those days with and um within that community and living in new york i realized how people are into that thing and how much uh, it's really like a big thing there at, at that time there was like seven years ago, it was way bigger than it was in France. Um, and I was missing doing art. I wasn't doing any product design anymore. So my husband told me I should, uh, you know, maybe like design some tattoos, try something with that. And I did. And then once I took the decision to like try something in the tattoo industry, everything went super fast. Uh, people loved my designs. They were asking me to draw tattoos for them uh, a tattoo shop in brooklyn took me um, as an apprentice i did about um, a year apprenticeship there and uh, quickly after that i got hired in a shop in the in the east in the village in new york and we opened flanoir tattoo six months after so it went very quickly oh my god that is so quick yeah but it was a it was a dream like i I guess I was um, lucky in the way that I started tattooing when also Instagram was starting and getting bigger. So I was able to share my work and people could see it and appreciate it. I feel like people who start tattooing those days, uh, knowing that uh, all social medias are a lot more crowded and the algorithm is a, is a nightmare. I think it's <laughs> harder to like uh, show your work me, I was at the time where um, it was kind of new, like for tattooers to be on social media. So I was able to, to be seen. And that, um, that was a big start for me in my yeah. career. I mean, that's actually how I found you is that I, a while back, I wanted to get girl power tattooed yeah. <laughs> on me and I oh, yeah. wanted it in a really thin feminine line. And so mm -hmm. that's very much your aesthetic is super, right. super thin. I mean, I'm, I'm, you, I know that you do sort of all different kinds of styles, but mm -hmm. that's what I was really drawn to. And I think a lot of other people are too, that you sort of create this really feminine um, sort of like vibe in a world that is typically maybe considered a little bit more masculine uh, yeah you know from the outside perspective of somebody who who doesn't ha have their body covered in tattoos who maybe just wants one symbol and still wants to feel like feminine and girly and you really speak to that audience can you talk to us a little bit about that and sort of how you developed your aesthetic into what it is of course yeah um i feel like it probably starts from uh, my experience when i was getting tattooed when i was younger I've always loved uh, very delicate designs. I love uh, things with tiny details, uh, very feminine. And when I was getting tattooed younger, a lot of tattoo artists were telling me it's not possible, they can't do that, uh, they don't have the needles, um, it doesn't stay well on the skin. So I kind of set up my mind that what I wanted to get as tattoos was just not possible. So I didn't do it and um, time goes. And I think my style when I was a prep designer was also very, um, very delicate. I used uh, like it felt very um, open and a lot of air in my designs, and that's what I've always loved doing. So when I was in New York and discovered tattooing, that was a longer time after I was getting my tattoos um, when I was young, and the techniques had evolved at that point. So there were like new tattoo machines and new needles and new inks, and I found out that what I wanted to do was actually possible and that um, maybe my designs that like the drawings I was doing were possible to make as tattoos. So I did my apprenticing in a very traditional tattoo shop, actually. I was not doing my style at all. They were doing very traditional American designs, which is very great uh, because I learned uh, in that way. That's how I learned to tattoo by doing a, uh, like rotary tattoo machine and uh, traditional designs. But when I was home, I was uh, practicing with my style of design. So I was buying uh, thinner needles and I was just uh, trying what I wanted to do. And I guess I found, uh, I found the right way because not many people were doing that at that time in New York. And really quickly, 
I got a lot of people telling me, oh my God, like I love your style. It's different. Uh, I think it's unique. I haven't seen what Anne is doing it. And I get just uh, many requests very quickly for tattoos. Um, now a lot more people do that. Like now Fine Line um, is, uh, is well known, but uh, there is place for uh, everyone. I feel like I, as long as it's your style. And I think uh, with my very thin uh, script, um, that's my handwriting, by the way, tattoo script is always my handwriting. Um, my flower designs, uh, geometric, I change a lot, but I feel like uh, um, I made my my own style in the, the tattoo industry and I'm happy because it worked and uh, and it's me, so it's perfect. Yeah, it, to me, like your story is so inspiring how you started sort of in one route that even in the creative industry, you still weren't able to really like fulfill your vision as an artist. You know, you were being creative mm -hmm. and you were a product designer and a graphic designer, but you still weren't ever really able to see your vision because like you said, working for a company like Dior, they, they already have their vision. So you're sort of yes. manipulating it. But what you did is you fully like took the way that you wanted something to look in an industry that's already like so established um, and made it your own. Yeah, and I so think, cool. Um, I, I think also what happened like personally to me is that I was waiting on my green card and I felt like, well, I have nothing to lose because like I can't work in the product design industry right now because I have to wait for my paperwork. So let's try to tattoo and see if it works. And if it works, awesome. And if it doesn't, I will just uh, go back to what I used to do, like product design. So I felt like I have nothing to lose, like just do it fully, like enjoy it as much as you can. And if it doesn't work, it's okay. I will just keep getting tattooed myself, but maybe it's not for me. Also, I'm afraid of, um, of getting shots and injection. Like I'm afraid of needles. Oh my so God. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if I can tattoo anyone. Like I, I'm not sure that's for me. And I was really anxious the first time I touched a tattoo machine because I'm like, oh my God, like what's going to happen? And surprisingly, the first time I did a tattoo, I was, I, I just thought I would never stop. Like, I'm like, okay, I got uh, such a big adrenaline that I thought this is really for me. Like, I can't stop. <laughs> we talked about this a little bit, actually, on your interview. You did a, a written Q&A um, for Ola Guapa. You were actually the second artist mm. that I featured. And you nice. really talked about your medium choosing you, which is something that I always ask, like, creatives. Like, did you choose it or did it choose you? And you said that it fully it chose, chose you. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have tattoos? Um, was it sort of like a part of who you were before moving to New York? Or do you really feel like, did your husband have tattoos? I didn't even know about how crazy your guys' love story was. So I feel like that was a huge catalyst in setting you on this path of tattooing. Did he have tattoos yeah. or did you before you guys met? Or we, we both had tattoos. I got my first tattoo when I was uh, 17 in the south of France. Uh, I really wanted a tattoo, but I was... Um, I was a minor at the time. You had to be 18 to get a tattoo. But uh, the tattoo artist had cats, baby cats he wanted to give away because he had too many baby cats in his house. So I told him I would get one if I could get a tattoo in exchange. <laughs> and he was like, okay, whatever. I have five <laughs> kitties in my house, so do it. And it's funny because I named that uh, cat Tattoo. And 10 years later, when I was, um, yeah, 27, I started to tattoo, to become a tattoo artist myself. So uh, yeah, it's not something that started when I became a tattoo artist. I've always loved um, the history of tattooing, uh, ornament uh, from like different uh, cultures. Uh, that's something that I've always been fascinated about. My husband as well, um, he was already not covered, but he had a bunch of tattoos when I met him. And uh, it's funny because when I was working in my bar, he was telling me that um, being frustrated, I was not making any art. He was telling me I should start drawing. And I've never drawn before New York. I was only doing product design. So I was making like plans for like a pro an object, but never just like freely minded like drawing. So he was buying me uh, sketchbooks and pens and I was telling him, I'm sorry, you're wasting your money. I don't, I mean, I'm not, I don't know what to draw. And he was, well, try and do something. And I was just 
it's not inspired because I did, I've never done that before. And one night he was working and just to make him happy, I opened one of the sketchbook to make a design. Like I'm like, okay, I'm just going to draw something. Like let's just, I did something abstract. I remember I just did like an abstract design and I loved it. And I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I just wanted to do more. So I just felt more inspired by just by starting doing it. My inspiration started to build. And I, I did like 10 designs in the book and he came back from work and he was like, holy shit, like, I thought you didn't draw. I'm like, yeah, I didn't know either. I had no idea. And that's how it started because um, it was what made me able to do art again without feeling frustrated. And I just discovered that I could draw and I could still feel what I felt with product design, like doing cool art. And that's what started everything, yeah. So my husband totally pushed me into becoming a tattoo artist. That's so cool. And I mean, what I love the most about your story is like, you didn't, I don't even know. I mean, it's, it's crazy to hear that. Okay. Like, first of all, you named your kitty tattoo. That was your first yeah, tattoo. Funny. So it was almost like foreshadowing this like dream that was ahead of you. She's but it's still like, alive. And every time I see her, oh. I'm like, <laughs> I had no idea when I got you that I would become a tattoo artist someday. <laughs> yeah. She was, she was a sign, but like yeah. every, every step along the way, it seems like you kind of you just kept saying like, yes, and yes, and yes, to these like new opportunities that were put in front Mm -hmm. of you. And even as a creative before, like, I think that there's the reason why, you know, I'm expanding on this a little bit is because I feel like there's probably creatives out there listening, who Mm -hmm. are in a creative industry and still not feeling satisfied and maybe asking like, what's wrong? Or, you know, I thought I followed the career path that I wanted to, but something's not clicking yet. And it's almost like, just keep going, just keep saying yes, just keep, um, you know, like leaning into these new opportunities. Mm -hmm. And you'll eventually find your path and it doesn't have to be traditional. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Completely. Yeah. I feel like um, you, you should just like listen to yourself. Like a lot of people that try to tell you, oh my God, but what are you doing? Like you are, you are studying product design and graphism and now you want to tattoo. Like, exactly. Are you serious? There is already so many tattoo artists. Like, why do you think you're going to be different? And then when we wanted to open our tattoo shop, Fleur Noir, why would you do that? Like there is so many tattoo shops already. And I feel like everyone has their mind on how things should be done. And if you keep listening to all of that, you will just never do anything. So for any artist I know, I'm like, I just want to tell them, do whatever you want and you feel. And it will work out if you believe in it. Like when I was working at Dior and because I had to quit Dior in order to like Which go is to like New a, York. Obviously a very well-known, you know, design house and established brand. Yeah. And you almost feel like I've had these interviews before where it's like there's creatives who feel like they have this sort of prestigious title and how yeah. can they give that up to explore something that maybe feels like a, like a step down, but it's like you have insight that nobody else has and you know where you're taking yeah. that. So just to believe yeah. in that. You have to really believe in yourself for sure. Also, I guess everyone is different, but me, I had knew since the first day that I was working in this big uh, luxury brand that that was not for me. And I'm like, maybe they're gonna make, maybe they will be able to make me think it's for me and I will start to get into that uh, daily routine Mm -hmm. and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. But I felt like that's really not for me and I'm not going to be happy. So I stayed over a year there and I had actually a calendar in my house and I was like one more day crossing the days thinking that this is not a life Laura like everyone is like oh my god you work for Dior it's so prestigious it's Mm -hmm. amazing you're killing it and I felt like I was pretending to be Mm -hmm. great because I'm like you you should be feeling that way right like everyone is happy for you you should be feeling that way and I was not I I I love the team and the people but I was very unhappy with the work and one day they, they gave me like a big uh, promotion and I just say no and I quit. And I remember the boss told me, Laura, I'm, I'm giving you gold in your hands. Like you have gold in your hands and you're just like telling me to fuck off. You're going to regret this for the rest of your life. And wow. you know what? I've never regret that decision <laughs> at all. Yeah, but it was hard. Mm-hmm. It was hard to take that decision knowing that not only the boss was thinking that way. I think my family and friends were like, are you sure? Like, this is a huge thing. Like, you're just going to leave and go to New York? And 
Deeply in me, I knew it was the right decision and I knew I'm a hard worker and I will always make my way to, towards what I want to do. And I think that's what everyone should do. It's like, it's hard, but just believe in yourself. It's, if it's what you really want to do, just you will get it in your own time. Absolutely. It's such good advice because I feel like, you know, the opinions of others and, and self-doubt is something that like we've talked about a lot in the few episodes on this podcast. And I think it's something that just universally everybody experiences. Yeah. And so it's an like extremely like important topic to talk about because nobody really wants to talk about it. I know, yeah. Because it's hard. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I want to go back to um, sort of you were in New York. You were um, with the drawing pad. You realized you could draw. Your husband was encouraging you. How do you take that and turn it into the career that you did. So did friends see your work and just decide that they wanted those tattooed on them? Or like, how did that evolve? So uh, it all started with the, the sketchbooks. And uh, from those uh, drawings I was doing, um, my husband got one of those tattooed on him. So he got a, a bear design that I drew on his, uh, on his leg. And he was a bartender at the time in New York, in Brooklyn. And many people saw that piece and they were like, oh my God, who did that? And he said, oh, it's that tattoo shop in Brooklyn, but my, my wife, Laura, she drew it. And people were like, oh, that's super cool. And, and they would ask me, oh, could you draw me a tattoo as well? So I wasn't a tattoo artist and I was not making any money out of it. I was just uh, drawing for like friends and friends of friends. And I really enjoyed it, but at some point, too many people were asking me to draw designs for them. So I started to, to charge money. And there was that website um, called Tattoo Do that just started at that time. And on Tattoo Do, you could make some tattoo competitions. So people would go on the website and say, oh, I want a, a unicorn with wings and, uh, and flowers to be tattooed on my chest. Uh, I'm, I have a budget of uh, $300. And I want to have the results in five days. And then everyone could like send over their designs and the one that the person will pick will get paid. And um, like, it was like, a, you know, a good little uh, challenge and very rewarding. So I was doing that more for fun, but I realized I was actually winning a lot of those competitions and making money from it. So that's when my mind started to be like, okay, it's interesting. Like, I was doing it for fun, but now I'm actually getting paid drawing tattoos. Uh, people seem to like my style, so maybe I can just go deeper in it. And that's when my husband was telling me that I should probably just try to tattoo myself and see if I like it. And um, if I do like it, then, you know, why not just make, uh, make a work out of that? So I, I went to the shop where my husband and I will get tattooed in a in Brooklyn and the first time they told me that I have to pay like two thousand dollars to get an internship with them and I say I, I don't have money like literally I had no money I was working in a bar as a waitress so I say I can't pay that so they say well then sorry we won't take you as an apprentice and time goes and people that I was designing designing uh, tattoos for they would get ta their tattoo at the shop so they would see my work very frequently. Oh, nice. So okay. three months later, I told them, okay, so you've been tattooing my designs a lot. So I feel like, you know, we're getting to know each other better. Like, I still want to be a tattoo artist. Like, would you teach me how to tattoo? And they say, well, you give us a thousand dollars and we will teach you how to tattoo. And I'm like, oh my God, I just don't have this money. I can't do it. And that, that's a funny story, but it's actually true. And I came back again three months later. And this time I was maybe more motivated in the way that the time I've gone, I've been doing more design. So I was just more secure in like, maybe that's for me. So I came and I told them, okay, I don't know how much money you're going to ask me to pay this time, but I just don't have any money. But I can see you don't have a great logo. You don't have a great website. You don't have an Instagram page. I can do that. Like I have done graphism and product design. If you let me learn how to tattoo with you, I will help you to do a like, better shop and I will help you welcome clients. And I just can give you what I have as well. 
And that's when he told me, okay, you can start tomorrow. And I'm that's like, an wow. ama- Yeah, that's okay. an amazing piece of advice. Awesome. Like to, to the, just the way that you were, you know, a lot of people hit a roadblock like that and it'll just shut them down or, you know, know. you didn't it's let hard. that happen to you. Yeah. It, it, I, I wanted to give up almost like it was a, like at that time too, there was not that many tattoo artists. Um, like it was more like a harder industry. I felt like to, to break in. So yeah. that shop to me was the only one that maybe could take me because some other shops, they had no idea about my work when they would see my, my work coming in very frequently. So yeah. I'm like, if they don't give me a chance, I don't see who else will do it. So right. I just didn't give up. I was keeping coming back and, yeah. and it worked. Yep. You kept your work in front of them and then you continued to find a way to provide them value. You know, what, like the money yeah. was probably such so short sighted in terms of the value that you could actually offer them. And so to like rephrase it like that, I think is a really good exactly. like, piece of advice or tip, um, you know, that any creative could take with them, whether or not they're looking for work or they're just hitting a challenge that they need to figure out like a new way to, to get over. Exactly. At the end of the day, I thought, okay, Maybe it's not just about money because I can give them that money, but I like I have value too. Like I can do a lot of things that they don't have. And building a website or building a page or doing a business cards or like doing graphic work, that can be expensive. And I can do that for them for free. Right. So if you teach me how to tattoo, I will do that for you. And I, at the end, if you work with trades, Maybe you can make your way everywhere. Yeah. No, it's a, that's a really, really good, um, I feel like, just little takeaway is, you know, trade yeah. versus money. Or it's, it's, a great, um, it's a great thing to just keep, like, at the front of your mind. Exactly. Um, did you feel like it was difficult being a female getting into this industry, or was that not a challenge that you faced? So, uh a lot of uh, my female uh, tattoo artist friends, they faced some issues. Luckily, I did not. Uh, I felt like I was really welcomed uh, easily. Also, I grew up with men. Like, I grew up with my, my dad and my brother. So, I, I don't know. I've, I usually didn't experience too much uh, problem. Um, only the boss I was working at at the first shop, uh, the, my mentor, the guy who teach me how to tattoo. Um, it, uh, it was kind of a crazy story. Uh, he was the owner of the shop. And a year after my apprenticeship, um, I went to go to work and the shop was closed. And the guy was uh, uh, trying to escape the police because he had uh, um, done some bad things to his girlfriend and was actually known as a um, having like assaulted some women in the past. And I was completely shocked because uh, like I had, didn't see that coming and I got really scared. And thinking about it, yes, yeah, there was a few times that maybe he a little bit disrespected me as a woman, but I felt like it was not really me as a woman. He just did that to anyone at the shop. He was kind of a dick. So <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, I never felt like I... I was being, uh, the fact I was a woman was a problem. He was just an asshole anyway. <laughs> so I, I, outside of him, that, that story, that was uh, very shocking because I lost my internship in one day. So um, the shop was closed, never reopened. And it took me a lot in my mind to be like, okay, the guy I was working under did some horrible things. Like I got scared. I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm lucky nothing happened to me. Cause some nights like, um, we would stay late at the shop or like, you know, finishing a tattoo. And I'm like, I don't know, something could have happened, but luckily uh, it never did. Uh, I've never seen him again. And I got scared because I was like, okay, so what I'm going to do now? Like I lost my, my internship and I was, you know what, maybe, maybe it's a good start because the thing with that shop is that uh, this guy that uh, was my mentor, I think he, he viewed me as a good money maker for the shop because my style was different and a lot of people will come to get my designs, but he will tattoo my designs, not me because I was still learning. 
-hmm. so he would tattoo all of my work mm -hmm. and it seemed like he didn't want me to go beyond a certain line like mm -hmm. he teach me a lot of things but he will never let me tattoo and at some point I was like is he going to really ever let me tattoo well because that's interesting that you say that because I'm wondering as a as a internship for a, as a tattoo artist how are you learning like are you just sitting because a year is a long time are you sitting and watching mm -hmm. him tattoo or how are you learning well tattooing is a big uh, thing like you just putting a needle in someone's skin so usually i mean most of the old school internships it's changing now but at the time uh, you will not tattoo for a very long time because you have to learn all the um, sanitary procedures you have to um, understand what's like the practice you're doing so you will be just uh, watching a lot cleaning the shop I clean the toilets and the floor every day for months uh, you just um, learning every type of inks every types of needles uh, every type of tattoo machines so it's just watching watching learning learning but you're not actually tattooing yourself Got it. Um, you can practice on grapefruits, on, uh, on different types of fruits, but until you actually start on real skin, it can take a long time. Got what it. I didn't tell my mentor is that on the side, I had got me a tattoo machine, a bad one. It was <laughs> a cheap tattoo machine. Uh, like I would never tattoo with that again, but I guess at the time, you know, I didn't have much money. So I was like, whatever, it's just to practice. And I was living with five guys, including my husband. So we were like six people being roommates and they were all uh, down to get tattooed. So I was practicing on the side on them because I had no pressure. I didn't care if it looked perfect. They just wanted to get a tattoo. So on the side of the shop, I was also starting to learn on my own. And I was telling my husband, I feel like with that shop, I'm kind of stuck in a place where he tattoos my designs. I'm not tattooing. And I don't want to tell him I'm tattooing on the side because he would be mad. So I'm like, that can keep going on for months or years. Like, when, when is it going to break? Like, when, when am I going to tell him I've already started tattooing? Or when is he going to really teach me the practice now? And when the shop closed, I felt like, okay, maybe that's my, that's my start of being myself, my own tattoo artist. I have no choice now. So I just started to use the tattoo machine I had at home and just tattoo and tattoo and tattoo a lot, mostly on friends or people I knew, just so it was more safe. Like I didn't want to tattoo a stranger in case there would be a problem. And I also got along really well with the other guys that worked at the shop. So they told me, if you need any advice, just call us. So I would tattoo from home and ask them for help or like a recommendation or uh, advices and from being home and having these guys helping me, I started to get good at tattooing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Your story is so inspiring. I mean, I feel like at, <laughs> at, at every single step of the way, you say like you didn't have a choice, but you did. I mean, you could have quit at, at any point. Oh, yeah. and you, you literally just kept going. And it seems like, you know, like your good nature sort of allowed you to, to establish all of these like relationships and a lot of people to trust in you and, you know, provide yeah. value and trade value, which is, which is a really cool thing. Um, and at the same time, you, I feel like kind of believed in yourself to the point where nobody was ever going to be able to shut you down. Exactly. And uh, like a funny story with that, uh, that mentor I had where I say that um, the guy, uh, you know, disappeared suddenly. Um, one, one night we were at the shop actually, and uh, it was raining a lot. It was late. It was midnight. And um, he, start, he, he finished tattooing pretty late. So I was waiting on him. And um, he had a, a pit bull dog and he knows I'm afraid of pit bull. I've, I, I was traumatized from when I was a child and I told him, okay, it's late. Like I'm going to go home. Do you need anything else? And he told me, yeah, I want you to walk my pit bull. And I'm like, but why? Really? Why? Like it's, it's late. It's raining outside. Plus I'm very afraid of this dog. And he's like, well, I want you to walk my pit bull. I have things to do. So can you do it? 
And I tell him, I, I don't feel comfortable doing it. And he tell me, well, do you want to be a tattoo artist, Laura? I'm like, yeah, I want to be a tattoo artist. He's like, so if you want to be a tattoo artist, you have to do what I ask you to do. So go walk my dog. And I did it. And it was very humiliating. I felt humiliated. I was crying while walking the dog. And I came home and I told my husband, like, why do I do that to myself? Like, I should have told him to fuck off. I should have told him no. But I really want to be a tattoo artist. Like, I want it so bad that I'm able to do all of those things and that maybe I should not be doing. And a part of me feels like, I think by going through all of the steps and never giving up and even being around like assholes like him, I'm where I am now and I know what I don't want to do anymore. And after that night, I'm like, okay, I want to be a tattoo artist. I'm going to go back to that shop, but I'm never fucking working with Pitbull again. But yes, you want me to be a tattoo artist? That's what I want to do for sure. Like I would never give up on that. And I will always remember his question because that's why I walk his dog because in my mind, I'm like, I don't care. Like this is humiliating me, but yes, I want to be a tattoo artist. Like I'm not going to give up. I have like full body chills hearing that story because it's like, yeah. it's like, you know, I, I fully like, not obviously in the exact same store in the exact same way, but I think that there's just so many artists who can relate to like yeah, that moment or a it's moment manipulated. like that. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, it's manipulated and it's like, it's, it's crossing your own limits on like, okay, what, what am I capable of doing? Like, this is not okay. But in the same time, I'm glad I did it because now it made me be who I am. And I know that when I have an apprentice, I will never do that to that person. I will never treat any artist that way. And that's not how you should be doing things. And I mean, this man is in jail now. So I guess like, you know, (laughs) Come now, yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. But I'm like, uh, I, 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 I just knew from the beginning I would not give up for any anything, and even that I did it just to become a tattoo artist, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. So when the when the shop closed down, um, you started tattooing sort of out of your house and on the side, and mm. and you were bringing in money that way. How long did mm-hmm. that last before you decided to actually open your own tattoo shop? I mean, you went from a totally different industry to taking on an internship to tattooing out of your house. And then all in a sudden you, I mean, it seems, you know, all in a sudden you built this incredible business for yourself and you became this badass business owner. How does that happen? How long is that process and what does it look like? Uh, so the, the shop closed, I'm working out of my apartment and a few months later, one of the guy that was working at the, the shop, one of the tattoo artists, he opened his own shop and he was looking for people to work at his shop. And he told me that he would hire me. So I was like, okay, cool. You want to hire me as an apprentice? And he said, no, I want to hire you as a tattoo artist. And I felt like, are you sure? Cause I never really finished my internship. It's, you know, there was not an end. And he said, well, I think you, you're ready to tattoo. Like, I want you to be a tattoo. After the shop closed. And I was, I was excited, but scared. I'm like, well, in my head, I was still an apprentice. And suddenly I become officially a tattoo artist. Um, but it went really quickly. I had so many clients, people who are booking me through Instagram or then going to the shop and seeing my work. And very, very quickly, uh, I think like right when I started, uh, I was booked for the next three months. So it was really crazy how quick it went. And that friend who hired me because he liked my work quickly changed, which is weird. Like seeing that I was bringing him good clientele and money instead of, uh, being thankful and being like nice to me, he was the opposite. He wanted me to work harder. He wanted me to work more. And he was, instead of being a friend like he used to be, he started to like money can change people. And yeah. he was like, keep working, work more, uh, like putting pressure on me all the time. And I was thinking, why do I do that? Like I could just have those clients in a different workspace where I'm happier 
and where it's, uh, you know, a way better energy and don't give him my money because when you work as a tattoo artist in a shop, you give a percentage on what you're making to the owner. Right. And I don't mind doing that if the owner respects me, but if you treat me like an asshole, why would I do that? Well, so it also... I yeah. I mean, yeah. it also sounds like when you're a new tattoo artist, you, you know, the value of going to a tattoo shop is for them to bring you clients because they're an established business. But it sounds like what was happening is you as a new tattoo artist were bringing him business. So he exactly. wasn't providing you very much value anymore. There wasn't that no. payoff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's why in my mind, it made no sense. I'm like, mm -hmm. you should be treating me well. Like I'm a nice person. I'm your friend. I'm bringing you clientele and money. I, if I was the owner of that shop, I would be like, oh my God, like, you know, uh, thank you. And like <laughs> helping you out. And Absolutely. he was doing the opposite. So hmm. I started to talk with my husband and telling him with the amount of clientele I have, I could have a private studio and just, uh, you know, do the same amount of work, but don't have to work under the pressure of like a, a shop owner that's just like, like literally being an asshole. Yeah. And me and my husband were starting to like make, a, you know, like a work a business plans to see how that could work. And as I was sharing the, the downstairs area of the tattoo shop with another artist named Barack. And he wanted to open his tattoo shop as well. And knowing that I was very new at tattooing, uh, I didn't have much experience, but I, I had a good style and, it was unique at the time and different. I had a good image, but Burak was uh, tattooing for 15 years and doing more traditional tattoos. So he was more um, deep in the tattoo art industry. He knew a lot more tattoo artists than I did, and he had way more experience. And on the side, my husband, who was a bartender, he was very social, very good at communication, at meeting people, at bringing, at bringing me clients. So we thought maybe we should just do that shop idea we had, the three of us together. And we started to talk about it more like, not as a joke, but more, okay, like, you know, let's, let's see what we come up with. And three months after we opened Fleur Noir. So wow. yeah, that was really crazy. <laughs> Very fast. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. How did things change go, going from being um, a tattoo artist to a business owner, especially that quickly? Was there like one, I mean, I'm sure you learned a million things, but was there like one thing that stood out or sort of one piece of advice that you could share or a lesson you learned? Um, I felt like it was a lot. It was like having a baby, to be honest. <laughs> it's like you have to take care of every aspect of um, of like the job you're doing so you like at the time I was focusing less on tattooing because you had to also like build the shop and uh, do uh, accounting and so many aspects and that's when I realized that I I just want to tattoo mostly like uh, I don't want to like that was just too stressful for me so being many uh, business owners were great, was great because we could like kind of share everyone like doing a specific type of the job. And I was focusing then more on like, um, like working on the image on the shop, like tattooing more and more people so we could bring more clients to the shop. So we really built the shop, uh, you know, with a French name, uh, more like a contemporary uh, tattoo shop with like a, a beautiful um, uh, backyard outside. Like uh, it's, it just doesn't feel like a traditional tattoo shop. So, um, we, we built it more like in my spirit and my image and I, I loved it. And that's when I feel, felt like, okay, I've always wanted to be my own boss and always wanted to work in my own space. And that's something I will never like go back to. That's, that's what I love doing. Like, um, putting the space together. Um, but, uh, a lesson I've learned, uh, I guess, uh, it's hard so many like, i know i know you learn so much being a, a business owner it's quite an adventure um i feel like sometimes when things go well you just want to keep going more and more and more and you have to take your time that's something i've learned for sure um you just want to keep going so fast and uh, 
it just gets too stressful. And when you're too stressed, it's hard to enjoy what you're doing anymore. And it's hard to, to remember like, you know, what took you in it at the first. So um, that's why also my husband and I decided to like move to France and have a smaller shop with less people because at the end it was just getting maybe too stressful, too many tattoo artists. Uh, we built an amazing business and um, like, it's just a wonderful place. But as a business owner, um, I started to enjoy less tattooing at some point, I think. And now that I'm in a smaller place, I'm going back to that. And, you know, it's important to like go back to the essential. And the essential was I want to draw tattoos for people and make them happy. And that's important to remember that. Yeah, it's actually such an interesting point that you touch on that. Because I think like it, maybe more of a traditional entrepreneur or entrepreneur entrepreneur starts yeah. a bit starts a business to really watch it scale and watch it grow and watch they want it to be as big as it can possibly be but i think that when you're a creative or an artist you're almost just trying to find a way to do what you love and make money doing it so while mm. i'm sure that there are certain artists who are looking to scale and grow and expand sometimes becoming a business owner of your art can actually take you away from creating and it yes, sounds like that's exactly. sort of what happened with you. And so it's, it's cool that you almost, you know, checked yourself in a way to say, I'm not going to let this get bigger than what I love, which is creating. Yeah. And that's also why, like, you know, you have to, uh, how do you say in English, to delegate. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, that's what I learned too. Like, okay, uh, my husband and my partner were like, okay, you need to, to stop stressing out. So how about you hire um, like an assistant or manager to help you with like your bookings because at, at one point literally I was drawing the tattoos for the next day during the night and then during the day tattooing and then at dinner or at lunch I was answering all my emails to do bookings and I had zero free time for my brain so yeah like hiring someone uh, which is uh, Morgan she's been uh, doing my bookings for three years now was already like a big, uh, a huge help and make me able to tattoo more. So yeah, I learned to delegate more. That's a great piece of advice as well. Yeah. And you're, so you're back in Paris or sorry, you're back in France and you're a new mom yeah. now. Yes, I am. How has that played it's into, uh, how is that, you know, being a business owner and a creative? I know we talked a little bit before we started recording, but can you sort of share that perspective as well? Well, uh, it's, it's actually a little easier than I thought. Like I was so scared because I'm such a work cowardly. I was telling my husband, I'm, I'm very afraid because I, I'm already in love with this baby. Like I was still pregnant. I'm like, I'm in love with this child, but I also love my work. And how am I going to be able to do both? I hear all of those moms telling me that um, for months they can sleep, they can go back to work. And um, it's impossible. It's like a crying baby. And I was getting very anxious of how I'm going to be able to combine both. Um, the thing is that we lucky, I don't have a crazy crying baby, so that helps already. Um, but also I'm lucky because we are two people. I guess, you know, there is a lot of single moms. And if I was not with my husband, I don't think I could have gone back to work already because yeah, it's a lot like the baby requires a lot of attention. But no, I'm just, uh, it's just a uh, logistic. Like, I know yeah. <laughs> she sleeps. I know that um, I maybe I don't sleep a lot at night, but I already didn't sleep much before, so that's not a huge uh, change. And then you know, a tiny baby sleeps a lot, so when she's awake, I just have to give her my whole attention. But whenever she sleeps, I just don't nap. I work like you sleep. I draw. Um, when I take uh, clients, I have my private studio at home, which is a big. Uh, luxury because a lot of people can't uh, do that so the fact that I'm tattooing at home is a big help because I can I can put an hour space between each each client if my baby needs to eat I'm right here uh, so yeah it's a big organization but being able to work from home and um, and uh, sometimes I just draw while she's on me like I put her on my chest and I have my iPad and I draw so I just it's just a fun thing. I just find new techniques, but uh, yeah, I'm still working and that makes me happy because uh, when your job is your passion, it's hard to, to give up on that. So yeah, yeah. I'm, 
I'm just managing all of that as a mom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thank you for sharing. Cause I, th- and being so vulnerable, you know, to say that you were afraid because I'm sure that there's so many creatives that are afraid that they will have to give up their career or everything that they've built or oh they God. can't have so it all. Scared. Yeah. And, and also I feel like, uh, that's for like, you know, future mothers. I think like it's the same with everything like with art that we talked about. It's like, don't listen to everyone. It's, we are all very different and everyone do what they want. But all those moms who told me it's going to be horrible and I could not, they tell me you won't be able to go back to work for at least like four months. Like you can't. And well, they can't. I did it. And mm-hmm. other mom did it like me. We are all very different. And what works for me doesn't work for another person. But all that I know is that maybe the women who tell me that they just don't love their jobs as much as I do. And they don't <laughs> need it as much as I do. Yeah. And I think a happy mom is a happy baby. And yeah. the fact that I'm able to work makes me be able to be happy. And I can give her even more love. I think if I don't tattoo at all or if I don't draw at all it just play with my nerve and it just makes me unhappy and how can I make her happy if I'm unhappy so it's just a circle everyone does their own thing as long as it works for you that's all that matters absolutely I love that I I wanna kind of wrap up with a, something that you said in your initial interview with Ola Guapa you said I feel so lucky to know that the day I disappear I will sort of still be here through my art yeah. in different parts of the world and on people I actually met it is the most beautiful thing can you speak to that a little bit well it's uh, I feel like I have a beautiful work I I don't just like draw things that will end up on people's uh, walls, but on their skins. It's uh, it's kind of a crazy thing to think about. Like I tattooed so many people over those years and I like, it happens to me that um, I walk to someone in the street and they're like, Oh my God, you tattooed me five years ago. Like, and I'm like, Oh my God, my art is still here and there and there and there. And it's like, I mostly do custom designs and most of my designs have a history. Like people tell me their stories, they have traumas, um, they have uh, moments they want to like remember forever and they ask me to draw something to put that on their skin. And knowing that, uh, you know, it's such a deep feeling and sometimes they cry when they are getting the tattoos, they laugh. Um, it's like a big psychological uh, session with me a yeah. lot of time. And, I feel like being able to put smiles on their face and being able to mark their life with something so important makes me feel like, yeah, I could literally die any day, but feel like I'm still living through my art. It's going to stay for a long time within those people. It's, it's beautiful. It really, really is. Thank you so yes, much for, for interviewing Thank you. With me and for taking the time. I know you're busy and your schedule is crazy. And I really... Oh, it's okay. She's sleeping. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get her while she's napping. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode with Laura. I hope you gained as much value and inspiration from her story as I did. If you love what you heard, please make sure you rate and review this episode on Apple Music and or Spotify. It really helps to spread episodes like this one to other creatives looking for their daily dose of inspiration. Plus, I would be forever grateful. But before we go, if you haven't already, make sure you head over to olaguapa.com to check out this month's collection of Guapa Gals, including a new collection of cute new accessories for the home and office, like prints, post-its, and coasters. You don't want to miss out on. So head over to olaguapa.com and discover your new favorite female-owned and artist-made brands today. With that, have a beautiful week, guapas, and as always, sending you tons and tons of inspiration and lots and lots of love.